reality, captured in user-friendly symbols and processed for understanding. The Idea Channel. Professor Hayek, we're going to discuss a whole range of things. Some of them certainly won't, won't be directly and easily attributed to economics, but uh, I hope we, we can just have an enjoyable uh, mm -hmm. discussion. I'd like to start talking about uh, something that uh, in the United States right now, there's a, there's a fad, and I, you may or may not be aware of it. Everybody's running. Yes, well, they're all they're out running uh, marathons. The New York mm -hmm. Marathon a week ago, they had 11,000 people in that run mm -hmm. who go out and, and uh, brutally throw themselves through 26 miles of activity. Mm -hmm. Do you have any reaction to those kinds of things in society? Why, why are people running all over the United States? Do you have a, do you have a perception on that? Well, I can see in general, I mean, it was conspicuous that the Americans did no longer walk. And my wife used to say she will soon lose, uh, they will soon lose the capacity of walking. I think some doctor discovered this. But writing spread like this, that again is a typical American thing, means it's not only difficult to generalize about the Americans in space, it's equally difficult to generalize about them in time. Mm -hmm. Because every time you come to the States, they have changed. Uh, is that unique in the world? Is, it, is, it, is that unique a unique of, feature? I think it's unique of grown-up people. It's very common with the young. And when I lecture to the revolutionary young people, I say, well, the reason I have no respect for your opinions is because every two years you have different opinions. And I think that is to some extent true of the Americans. It's a, in a sense a virtue. You change your opinions very rapidly, so if you have something very absurd at one time, there's a good chance you will have forgotten about it next year. And, why, and, and do, you, do you think that the running is simply a fad in that sense? It's an expression? Uh... No, I think there's something healthy about it. The feeling that you ought to exercise your body, that you have had not enough exercise. What amazes me is how rapidly things like, like that can spread. In another country it would come very slowly and uh, include a certain part of the population. But uh, last time I was in the state and I had a stay in a hotel in Greenwich Village and in the middle of the town in the morning there was a stream of people walking, <laughs> uh, jogging uh, before me in a town. It looks very curious here in the campus. Of course, it uh, seems quite natural. Yes, when people run up and down city streets, it does uh, give you a, a well. Uh, I, I still, within your, your comments, it's interesting that that it, there seems to be something unique then uh, in the United States in terms of, you mentioned the speed that, it, that, that the fad develops. Mm -hmm. Do you have any sense of what this difference is? Is it a... No, I don't really know. Uh, perhaps a uh, degree of constant communication with the uh, media, now one has to call it media, it used to be the press, mm -hmm. which is much greater than you would expect with people of the same general level of education. They're compared with current influences, the basic stock of education is rather low. It's a contrast between the two. And the European peasant may be of less basic education, but is not subject to the same stream of constant current information. Usually people who are subject to such a stream of current information have a fairly solid stock of basic information. Mm -hmm. But in America we have this flood of current information impacting upon comparatively little basic information. That's interesting. And I, I, I sense maybe even a chicken and the egg that, that the, the currency, currency for current information, mm -hmm. 
tends to drive out the other. It, you know, schools focus on current things, on current materials, rather than on, in a sense, the basics. Uh, yes, probably. I haven't thought about that, but that fits in with what I said. Yeah. Would be why, for example, classical education is no longer uh, at all a common thing in the United States. You see, I used to define what the Germans called Bildung, a general education, as familiarity with other times and places. <coughs> in that sense, the Americans are not very f educated. They are not familiar with other times and places. And that, I think, is a basic stock of uh, a good general education. Mm -hmm. They are much better informed on current affairs. Yeah, that's true. Newspaper mm -hmm. magazines are devoured in the United States. Although that's true in other countries, isn't it? Yes. But uh, I doubt whether Americans are book readers. See, if you go to a French provincial town and find a place full of bookstores, then come to a big American city and can't find a single bookstore, that suggests a very fundamental contrast. From, from your point of view, uh, which is how many years have you been, been observing the human affair? You're how old? Oh, I'm in my 80th year. Your 80th? Yeah. That's right, you celebrated your birthday just recently, is that correct? No, no, I'm... <coughs> or you're approaching it. I've passed into my 80th year. Oh. I will be 80 next May. 80 next May. Well, that's... Uh, you certainly then have a perspective of a very long period of time that you've observed things. And I knew the United States for 57 years. 57 years. Within your own experience, uh, your personal experience, have you, is, is this tendency for rapid change? You, you made the comment earlier. You said mm -hmm. that, that in the United States it's different because it's, it's a characteristic of the young, but in the United States it seems to prevail throughout the entire mm -hmm. society. Have, have you, uh, can you identify changes in your own, from your own experience? Can you changes identify, in the United States? No, I'm sorry. Changes in how you approach things, i.e., can you identify... Oh, surely, surely, very much so. I mean, not to speak about the great break of the First World War, you know, I grew up in a world. I think that is a great break in my recollected history. The world which ended either in 1914 or, more correctly, two or three years later, when the war had a real impact, was a wholly different world from the world which exists since. The tradition died very largely, it died particularly in my native town, Vienna, which was one of the great cultural and political centers of Europe and uh, became the capital of a republic of peasants and uh, workers afterwards. And while, curiously enough, and the same we are now watching in England, the intellectual activity survives this decay for some time. The economic decline already was fairly dreadful, cultural decline. So I became aware of this great break very acutely. But I would say, leave this out of account and speak only of the last uh, 50 or 60 years. Yes. I suppose in all spheres, but uh, in the political sphere very noticeably. Now, one of my favorite gags is to say, when I was a very young man, nobody except the very old man still believed in classical liberalism. When I was in my middle age, nobody except myself did. <laughs> and now I find that nobody except the very young believe in it. That's interesting. And that gives me some hope in the future of the world. Yes, it's truly. Uh, it, it, you, you mentioned change earlier, as, mm. and the fact that, that change has occurred so rapidly in the United States is a positive thing. Do you, you mean that, uh, I assume you do have some reservations, though, about rapid change. Oh, yes. Uh, I think it's a very serious problem as far as moral change is concerned. And while on the one hand I believe that morals necessarily evolve and should change very gradually, perhaps the most spectacular and almost unique uh, occurrence in our lifetime was a 
fashion which refused to recognize traditional morals at all. What was the final outbreak of the counterculture of the people who believed that what had been taught by traditional morals was automatically wrong, that they could build up a completely new view of the world. I don't know whether it ever occurred before. Mm -hmm. Perhaps it came in the form of religious revolutions, which in a sense are similar, but this sense of superiority of the deliberately adopted rules of conduct as against all the cultural or traditional rules is perhaps in the moral field the most spectacular things I've seen happening in my lifetime. It certainly began in the, well I have to correct myself at once, it did happen in Russia in the last century. But in my lifetime, it happened the first time in the 40s and 50s and started from the, at least from the English-speaking world. I'm not quite sure whether it began in England or in the United States. And that created in some respects a social atmosphere unlike anything I can remember or has happened in, I must now say, Western European history. When I think about it, the attitude of the Russian intelligentsia in the middle 19th century seems to have been similar. But of course one hasn't really experienced this, one knows this from uh, novels and similar descriptions. Perhaps even the time of the French Revolution. I don't think it went as deeply even then. Well, the most current one, the 60s and the change there, mm -hmm. that's one that I have personal, some personal yes. familiarity with. It, is there any sense in which that was simply a fad, going back to what we were talking about earlier, that it was, uh, that it spread rapidly, that it was, uh, are, there, are there any similarities? Let's, is there any similarity to how quickly the running thing has evolved and how quickly ideas in this sense? Oh, yes, oh, yes. Uh, particularly in the sense that uh, the Americans are more liable to this sort of quick change. There is a much more deeply ingrained uh, tradition on the continent then there is, well, I should add, in American urban life. I don't know American rural life at all. And they may do injustice to the rural American. All I see is the urban American. But the urban America is certainly often instability and uh, changeability which I have not come across anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Do you perceive a balance to that? There, it would seem to me you have to have some balance in society or that would uh, run amok, so to speak. But the very balance uh, uh, consists in the fact that they are passing fashions. They have great influence for the moment, but uh, I should not be surprised if, uh, well, in this case I might be surprised, but let me just give you an example. If I come back again in, say, two years, which is my usual interval, I shall find people are no longer jogging. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, the ones who do are, are in some way uh, different from the others. There's a, there's a hard core that I would assume would continue, but that their motivation I, uh -huh. is different than those of the, of the balance. You know, I uh, don't think jogging is... Uh, to me a very good illustration because if I were 18 or 20 I feel I might do it myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, most of the follies I observe are of the kind which I wouldn't do myself. Yes, yes. Well certainly a, as a class it's, it's different than, than the uh, musical, for example, the, the way music changes yeah. and the styles of music. And I, th I think you've referenced the fact that it, do it does have another element to it, which is the f physical well-being of the individual is supposedly yeah. involved. So it's more than simply something to do. Uh, I, I, so I agree, it's probably a more complex one. 
but, uh, but it certainly is something that has come about very rapidly oh, very in the United rapidly, States. Yes. Um, do you feel in the long run uh, that, that these, these kinds of rapid changes, the, 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 this have a role to play in world society? Is the United States, is the, is the experience here in the United States of any, of any um, guidance to the world? Is, is the change, it seems to me we have a society in which change is something we have to deal with. You oh, know, surely, surely. We have books written about that, etc. cetera. Um, future shock and these other popularized approaches. See, my problem with <coughs> all this is the role of uh, what are commonly called the intellectuals, which I have long ago defined as the second-hand dealers in ideas. And for some reason or other, they are probably more subject to waves of fashion in ideas and more influential in the United States than they are elsewhere. Uh, certain main concerns can spread up here in an incredible speed. Take the conception of human rights. Now, I'm not sure whether it's an invention of the present administration or whether it's of older date, but I suppose if you told an 18-year-old that human rights is a new discovery, he wouldn't believe it. He thought the United States had for 200 years been committed to human rights, which of course would be absurd. The United States hadn't discovered human rights two years or five years ago. And suddenly it's the main object and leads to a degree of interference with the policy of other countries which even if I sympathize with the general aim, I don't think it's in the least justified. People like Chile or South Africa have to deal with their own problem, and the idea that you can use external pressure to make the people who after all have built up a civilization of a kind, is a very morally very doubtful belief. But it's a dominating belief in the United States now. Mm -hmm. It clearly is. Is it is that true in other countries, or is it, again is that unique within the United States? Are we as a people tend uh, do we tend I, to rush headlong into everything? Uh, <laughs> I can't quite judge whether in countries like England and Germany the thing is being followed to please the United States, or whether it is a spontaneous movement. My feeling is it's very largely done where we have to conform with what the United States do. Hmm. That's interesting too. So that you have two out, two aspects of it. Mm -hmm. One is the direct involvement of the United States, mm -hmm. and the other is the indirect influence it has on on its partners in the world. So See, it's so clear that in some respects, uh, American America is bringing pressure on the other countries in respects where by no means obvious that they are morally right. I mean, I've been watching in two countries now the pressure brought by the United States to inflate a little more. Both Germany and Japan are under pressure from the United States to help, as it is imagined, by inflating a little more, which is, I think, both unjustified and unjust. And yet it's, <coughs> I think, indicative of the extent to which uh, certain opinions which are generated in Washington are imposed upon the world. Well, an earlier instance was the extreme American anti-colonialism, the way in which, for instance, the Dutch were forced overnight to abandon uh, Indonesia, which certainly isn't done good to anybody in that form, which I gather was entirely due to American pressure, with Americans being completely unaware that the opposition to colonialism by Americans is a rather peculiar phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Well, th that, as a class, those kinds of, of intrusions mm. into policy matters worldwide, etc., don't, uh, don't they represent a uh, failure to perceive cause and effect relationships clearly? Isn't that part of it? 
Uh, yes, uh, too great readiness to accept very simplified theories or explanations. The situation. Uh, the, the thing that occurs to me too is that is that one acts in this case in the anti-colonial spirit mm. to divest the Dutch of their holdings in Indonesia, perceiving that to be a good. You know, I could yet not, you've said it was it was no, certainly not a good. No, no. I could not conceive an experience in any other country which I had, I forget what year it was, in the United States. When suddenly every intellectual center went was talking about Toynbee. Toynbee was a great rage. Two years later I think everybody had forgotten about him again. Mm -hmm. <coughs> do you have that do you have a problem with that personally? How how has your currency risen and uh, and fallen it over. Has, has there been a cycle? Do you find oh, periods very, in which very people much, much so? And uh, to a different extent in different countries. I had a fairly good reputation as an economic theorist in 1945 or 44 when I published The Road to Serfdom. Even that book was uh, accepted in Great Britain by the public at large as a well-intentioned critical effort, which is some justification. It came in America just at the end of the great enthusiasm for the New Deal. And it was treated even by the academic community very largely as a malicious effort by a reactionary to destroy high ideals. With the result that my reputation was down to bottom, even among the academics. Uh, you know, it has effects to the present day. I have, uh, as is almost apparently inevitable, since my Nobel Prize, been collecting honorary degrees. Quite a number but not one from what you call a prestigious universities. The prestigious universities still regard the uh, reactionary, as I am regarded, as intellectually not quite reputable. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it happens that uh, by the more conservative places I am still respected in intellectual circles, at least until quite recently, uh, was a rather doubtful figure. There uh, was one instance in about uh, four or five years after I published The Route to Serfdom, when a proposal of an American faculty to offer me a professorship was turned down by the majority was one of the big American universities. So I had a long period I didn't particularly mind when, uh, at least amongst the intellectuals, my reputation was very low down indeed. I think it has uh, recovered very slowly in more recent years perhaps since I published The Constitution of Liberty, which seems to have appealed to some people who did not completely share my position. And so it uh, has been slowly rising again. But uh, in a way, you know, I didn't mind because I hadn't been particularly happy with a predominantly political reputation in the 40s and 50s, and that later my reputation rested really on, again, on my purely scientific work, I didn't uh, particularly mind. If I recall, in your foreword or introduction to Road to Serfdom, you specifically made that comment, that oh, yes. you were venturing into this area with a good deal of tre uh, trepidation well, and hesitation. But that you felt compelled to do it because yeah, you, yeah. You, you saw threats to, yeah. to liberty. Yeah, oh yes. And yet, despite that, uh, it was not accepted in that, in that spirit. No, no, it wasn't accepted in the United States. Mm -hmm. It wasn't right. But in England, the general opinion was ready for this sort of criticism. I don't think I had in England a single unkind criticism from an intellectual. I'm not speaking about the politicians, I mean, 
both Attlee and Dalton attacked me, attacked the book as one written by a foreigner, so I had no better argument. <laughs> <coughs> but uh, intellectuals in England received it in the spirit in which it was written. While here I had, on the one hand, unmeasured praise from people who probably never read it, and uh, most abusive criticism from the, some of the intellectuals. Is it, it's currently more popular, is it not? I mean, well, it's, it's being coming back? Covered, yes. Yes, it, 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 it's the kind of book that the lay reader, the lay mm -hmm. public, would seem to me can deal with, as opposed to a more technical economic book. Uh, you mentioned the, the, for, the use of the word foreigner in the exchange with Britain is an interesting one. Uh, and it relates to some other things we were talking about. And I wanted to ask this question earlier. I think maybe this would be an appropriate time. And that is the, the extent to which, and I know you've done some recent thinking about this, the extent to which culture, in some definition, plays a role in, in the ordering of world activities. Um, you mentioned the intervention in the aspects of the United States. And it would seem to me that some element of that, uh, of, the, of the wrongness of that, is based in an inability, it would seem to me. It doesn't mean this is, that, we're, that we're inept, but it's just a, it seems to me a natural inability for one culture to fully understand and deal with another. Do uh, you have any thoughts on that? Like there's, the Japanese. Uh, there's something in that, but... Uh, it is not necessarily the culture into which you were born which most appeals to you. You know, culturally I feel my nationality now is British, not Western. Uh, it may be due to the fact that uh, I spent the decisive, most active parts of my life between the early 30s and the early 50s in Britain, that I brought up a family in Britain. But it was really from the first moment that uh, arriving there, I found myself for the first time in a moral atmosphere which was completely congenial to me, which I could absorb overnight. Which I admit I had not the same experience when I first came to the States ten years earlier. I found it most interesting and fascinating, but I did not become an American in the sense in which I became British. But I think this is an emotional affair. My temperament was more like that of the British than that of the American, or even of my uh, native uh, fellow Austrians. And that, I think, is to some extent a question of your adaptability to a particular culture. I used at one time to speak fairly fluent Italian. I could never have become an Italian. But that was an emotional matter. I didn't have the sort of kind of uh, uh, feelings uh, which could make me an Italian. While at once I became, in a sense, British, because that was the natural attitude for me which I discovered. I sometimes say it was like uh, uh, stepping into a warm bath, but the atmosphere is exactly that of your body. <laughs> It's a, it suggests a very fascinating way of classifying personality types. You could classi probably is, classify yeah. them by the, by the culture within which they would feel most comfortable. Mm. Mm. It's, it suggests that, uh, that, uh, that ethnic uh, association, ethnic relationships, uh, are a matter of, of personality, not one's birthright or, uh, uh, or even one's place of, mm. of habitation. Yes, oh yes. What was it about the British? Can you identify in any way why you felt comfortable? What, or what, what is it about you that makes you comfortable with the British? Um, the strength of certain social conventions which make people understand what your needs are at the moment without mentioning them. Uh, Can you give us an example? The way you break off a conversation, uh, you don't say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm in a hurry. You become uh, 
slightly inattentive and evidently concerned with something else. John doesn't need a word, your partner will break off the conversation because he realizes, without you saying so, that you really want to do something else. No word need be said about it. There's absolute respect for the indirect indication that I don't want to continue at the moment. How would that differ in the United States? More direct? Either he might force himself to listen to you attentively and do as if we were attentive, or he might just break off and say, oh, I beg your pardon, but I am in a hurry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it would never happen. Well, you can never say never happen, but that is not the British way of doing it. <laughs> How does it differ from the Austrian? Well, there would be an effusion of polite expressions explaining that you are frightfully sorry, but in the present moment you can't do it. They would talk a great length about it, but no word was said about it in England at all. And from your point of view, it is a question of then the, is it the, the comfort of, of shared understanding? It's like mm -hmm. you, you don't have to... It's the old saying, you don't have to tell someone you love them, if you love them. It's, no, it's like, you, 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 it's you might sit together with somebody and you don't have to carry on a conversation. <coughs> and, that, and you find that very, very comfortable, I personally. find it very congenial to me. It's a way in which I would act naturally. Does it in any way relate to your, uh, to your intellectual persuasion or convictions? Is there any... Is there any um, continuity between the two? It may well be, but I'm not aware of it. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't be surprised if somebody discovered that my general way of thinking made me fit in better in this sort of convention than into any other. That's because, again, that would suggest itself in terms of how ideas flow and are developed and supported. Yes. That it w it does, doesn't that suggest that a culture has an important role to play in, the s in sustaining certain ideas? Well, you might find an answer to this by studying the difference between British literature and literature of other countries. I shouldn't be surprised, but I can't give evidence mm -hmm. offhand. Another quick thought. Road to serfdom, you said, was received quite favorably in Britain, except for the politicians. As, as a reflection now, from the point of view of 1978, it, it would seem it did not have the, the required effect. <laughs> Do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, and and the, the corollary being that the United States has, at least at this point in time, not suffered quite as much a uh, diminution of, of the of, of liberty uh, that, that, is, that seems to be apparent in Britain. You know, in a sense, I believe the British intellectuals, in their majority, are less committed to doctrinaire socialism than, say, the Harvard intellectuals. <coughs> they still have their great uh, sympathy with the trade union movement, and refuse to recognize that the privileged position which the trade unions have been given in Britain is the cause of Britain's intellectual in, uh, economic decline. But the British Labour Party is not predominantly a socialist party, but is predominantly a trade union party, which is something very different. And although there are always some doctrinaire socialists in the government, I think they are a small minority. It's not, from a socialist point, as bad as it seems to be in Russia, where Solzhenitsyn assures us that there's not a single Marxist to be found in Moscow. Uh, but I doubt whether there are more than two or three radical socialists to be found, or five or six, in the leading uh, figures in the British Labour Party. It is essentially a trade union party. But doesn't it, though, still incorporate the basic kinds of, of, um, of, of threat 
to, to personal freedom in the long term that you oh, yes. in, 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 in the effects, of course, they're driven by their policies, which are made necessary by the trade unions, into inc ever increasing controls, which makes things only worse. And yet, in addition, but even that was initially caused by the trade union problems, the great dominance of Keynesian monetary theories. But it is rather important to remember that even in the 1920s, when Keynes conceived his theories, it started out all out from the belief that it was an irreversible fact that wages were determined by the trade unions. And you had to find a way around this, and he suggested the monetary way to mm -hmm. circumvent this effect. Well, the area of economics others will pursue are more qualified. Let me come back to some things that I feel more comfortable with. Uh, I'd be very fascinated to chat with you a little bit about why are you ex what is, what is it that has made you excited? Obviously, you're excited about life. I sense a I, I sense a sparkle in the eye and uh, and a ch uh, get up in the morning with a challenge. Uh, uh, what I is it? How would you identify that, that? That on the whole I'm healthy. On the whole, you're healthy. <laughs> you see, uh, I say this now because I had a uh, fairly recent period in my life in which I was not, which all you said would not have applied. Uh, there are evident some physical reasons for it, and the doctors don't agree, but uh, from my 70s to my 70, 50 years, what you say just would not have applied. Before and afterwards it did. And uh, so my answer must really be, I am a healthy, now and I have been most of my life a healthy person. Mm -hmm. you, of course, healthy means both physical and mentally. In, in well, these things are very closely related. Uh, and, you know, I belong to the people who really regard the mental process as part of the physical process of a degree of complexity which we cannot fully comprehend. But I do not really believe in a metaphysically separate mental entities. They are a product of a highly developed organism, far beyond anything which can explain. But still, there's no reason to assume that they are mental entities apart from physical entities. Mm -hmm. Now, they, obviously, you're referring to, to Freud and the whole Austrian uh, uh, psychologists mm -hmm. in the school there, which, are, as you uh, clearly, as a fellow countryman, you would have direct mm -hmm. uh, feelings about. Well, you know, in my recent lecture, I have a final paragraph in which I admit that while apart from many good things, although some not so good came from Austria, much the worst of it is psychoanalysis. Why do you feel that? Why do you feel psychoanalysis is, uh, suffers from that? Well, there are two different reasons. I think that it has no... Uh, scientific standing, but I won't enter into this. It has become the most destructive force in destroying traditional morals. And that is the reason why I think it's worthwhile to fight it. I mean, I'm not really competent to fight it on the purely scientific grounds. Also, as you know, I've also written a book on psychology, which perhaps partly explains my scientific objections. But it is largely the actual effect on of the Freudian teaching that you ought to cure people's discontent by relieving them of what he calls inhibitions. These inhibitions have created our civilization. Mm, yes, indeed they have. It was interesting, as you were saying, that the feeling of good is something we certainly, most of us want to achieve. Uh. A feeling of good, of value, but uh. a good, a good, good, let's stay with that for a minute. And, and, and the obeying, if you would, or, or the following of a moral structure seems to contribute to that, doesn't it? Yes, the way I put it now is that um, 
good is not the same thing as natural. What is good is largely a cultural acquisition based on restraining natural instincts. And Freud is, has become the main source of a much older error that the natural is good and what you would call the artificial restraints are bad. For our society, it's the cultural restraints on which it depends. And uh, the natural is frequently the bad. Mm -hmm. Now, one, one thought that occurs to me in trying to uh, uh, explore that further is the feeling of good, for example, of a group of individuals who have um, well, they 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 have they recognize in 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 each other or several of them uh, something which, in a way, I think you were getting at when you commented on the British, i.e., that that they acquiesce to a common set of of behavioral standards, and the feeling of good comes out of the the kind of mutual flow of recognition back and forth that that occurs. I, if I walk into uh, yes. a group of these people, I, I feel good because I know they, they identify that I'm meeting their standards. Yes, but it leads to the very fundamental issue, the conflict between common concrete ends and common formal rules which we obey. Our instincts, which we have acquired in the primitive band, are to serve the known needs of other people and to pursue with other people a known common goal. That is something very different from obeying the same rules. The great society in which we live in peace with people whom we do not know and serve largely people whom we do not know has only become necessary because we have learned to some extent to suppress the natural instinct that it's better to work for a common goal with the people in which you have lived and to work for the needs of people whom you know. This we had to overcome to build a great society. Mm -hmm. But it's still a cultural restraint on our natural instincts. And if anybody like Freud then comes up, the natural instincts are the good, good one. Free them from artificial restraint, it becomes the destroyer of civilization. The word artificial, it gets thrown around an awful lot. Uh, free them from artificial restraints. Are the restraints artificial? I uh, know. I it was. I was really inconsistent by using the term in that connection because I stress that the confusion in this field is largely due to the dichotomy which derives from the ancient Greeks between the natural and the artificial. There is between the natural and artificial the cultural, which is neither natural nor artificial, but is the outcome of a process of selection, which was not a deliberate one, but is due to the fact that certain ways of behaving have proved more successful than others, without anybody understanding why they were more successful. Now that, of course, is neither natural nor artificial. I think the only word we have for it is cultural. The cultural all is between the natural or innate on the artificial, which ought to be confined to the deliberately designed the mm -hmm. way in which we can describe it, it is a cultural. Yeah, see, the, the use of artificial by um, proponents of directed change, mm -hmm. it seems to me, it is, uh, is that kind of distortion. To, to use it as a, as a rhetorical mm -hmm. weapon mm -hmm. To say to someone, why, that's artificial, you shouldn't be doing that. You know, uh, again, the Freudian uh, thing, remove your inhibitions and you're going to be a wonderful person and enjoy life. And, yet, and, and, and the argument then is that these inhibitions are artificial. Yes. And they, they clearly are not in this. In the, it, to, you're saying that to the degree that they are a voluntary uh, 
uh, voluntarily agreed to, even even subconsciously, that they certainly w would you call that artificial or not? Or that is that in the mid ground? I would. I think this is intermediate ground for which we have no other word but cultural, which people confuse with artificial. But cultural is not artificial because culture has never been designed by anybody. It's not a human invention. In fact, I go so far as to say it's not the mind which has produced culture, it's culture which has produced the mind. I wish we would need a great deal of explanation. Yes. No, I understand. <laughs> I was going to see if you would <laughs> you'd go further. <laughs> you would. Uh, there's an interesting, uh, and, and I know you've dealt with this, the interesting problem that suggests is that the Cultural restraints seem to be a necessity within a society. Mm. How does the individual achieve freedom, liberty, personal, uh, within those... What is the... Freedom has been made possible by the restraint of freedom. Uh, it's only because we all obey certain rules that we have a known sphere in which we can do what we like. But that presupposes a restraint on all of interfering in the protected sphere of the other. Which in the end comes to private property, but it's much more than private property in material things. Uh, I like to say the primitive man in the small band was by no means free. He was bound to follow the predominant emotions of his group. He could not move away from his group. Freedom just did not exist under natural conditions. Freedom is an artifact. Again, the word artifact is the one we currently use, but it is not a result of design, not of deliberate creation, but of a cultural evolution. And this cultural evolution produced abstract rules of conduct, which finally culminated essentially in the private law, the law of property and contract, and the surrounding uh, number of uh, moral rules, which partly support the law, partly are presupposed by the law, the difference between law and uh, morals is essentially that uh, the law concerns itself with the things where coercion is necessary to enforce them and which have to be kept constant while uh, morals uh, can be expected as they acquired, tra acquired traditional traits of individual conduct which are also to some extent experimental and where it's not a calamity if you find a person have to deal with does not obey current morals. But it is a calamity if you find that a person with whom you have to deal does not obey the law. Can you give us two specific examples of that? Or, I mean, one specific example of each. Well, I must be assured that people are made to keep contracts if I am to make contracts and rely on them. Uh, but in the whole field of honesty, you know, there are kinds of honesty which, uh, if they did not exist, would make normal life impossible. And there are minor kinds of honesty which are not defined by the law, which the law does not define because they are not essential. So that if I were to, if I were to enter into a, a, an effort mm. to uh, violate a contractual agreement, mm. that is a, a level of dishonesty that would be dealt with by the law, mm. and as you said, would be of the calamitous mm. type. I mean, we're taking it in a small sense, mm. uh, but on the other hand, if if the uh, if if I choose to do something. Um, that uh, violates your sense of propriety, mm. that is not calamitous. No, that wasn't... Uh, I mean, it may be calamitous to our relationship, but it's oh not yes, calamitous yes, yes, in yes, the yes. sense I of... I can still live a sensible life, even if people around me will not follow certain moral rules. 
But it is absolutely essential, and I think this is perhaps important to state, because the difference between my view and some of my friends who leaned into the anarchist camp, that within the territory within I live, I can assume that any person I encounter is held to obey certain minimal rules. I cannot form voluntary groups of people who obey the same rules and still have an open society. I must know that within the territory in which I live, any unknown person I encounter is held to obey certain basic rules. And not his own? Not words. his own. Certain common basic rules which are known to me. Mm -hmm. which, mean, which is then the, the, the weakness of a concept that bases everything on voluntary association yes. because you don't, the stranger has his own voluntary association, you have yours, yes. and there's no commonality. Libertarianism quite easily slides into anarchism. And it's important to draw this line that an open society in which I can deal with any person I encounter presupposes that certain basic rules are enforced on everybody within their territory. Uh, the thought occurs to me. The difficulties in Africa of bringing into existence some forms of nation states, it seems to me, with the tribal kinds oh, of elements, is, a, sure is an that, example of that. Surely, very much so. That the tribes have their own voluntary <laughs> rules, but they're all different. Well, it's uh, very doubtful whether you can, under these conditions, impose the whole apparatus of a modern state. I think if you achieve over a period of the next few generations that minimum that the people within the territory will all learn to obey the basic rules of individual conduct, that's the optimum we can hope for. Well, it, it, that's something. It's, mm -hmm. it's worth something. We're going to, we're just about out of tape. We're going to take a break. I want you to, I want you to answer one more question and then we'll take a break and relax a little. You, you indicated that your cycle of coming to the United States about every two years, is, is, this, is this one of those? Has it been about that long since you've been? When, when was the last time you visited? Oh, only 18 months ago. 18, so you've I shortened the <laughs> cycle. <laughs> but uh, it just so happens. I think I can tell you roughly, I was in the United States in 45, 46, uh, 47, 49, 50, and from 50 to 62 I lived here. And since 62, well, there was a long break, which, uh, no, next few years, probably every three or four years, then there was a period of ill health when I hardly traveled at all. But since then, I must have been here every two years. Mm -hmm. What is the one thing this trip that you've noticed that has changed? What's the thing that impacted on you as, as being the most recent fad or change or whatever? Has there been any? Well, I've been here too recently because even jogging was already <laughs> even jogging was there. 18 months ago. <laughs> Uh, and I have, uh, except for a single day in Seattle, been only just one week on the campus and haven't left the campus of Stanford. You didn't visit the King Tut exhibit in Seattle, did you? When? The The treasures, the King Tut, no, uh, the no, Egyptian. No, no. Uh, I was there, uh, I have seen this before, the exhibition before, uh, not only in Cairo itself, but uh, I've seen the exhibition in London. Uh, well, that was the diversion. What, what, at what point in your visits to the United States was there a period in which you were absolutely uh, um, abashed at the change that occurred? Oh, was there of course, between 24 and 45, it was a different country. I mean, the experience of the New Deal, of the Great Depression and so on, had changed the atmosphere to an extent that the intellectual, the exterior, of course, was familiar, but the intellectual atmosphere had changed completely. So far as the intellectual atmosphere was concerned, I came in '45 to a country wholly different from what I remembered from '24.